Uh, cool. Yeah, yeah, let's start. Um, so today we're doing a bit of um, bit of rheumatology, but also a bit of a mix of general medicine. Um, we thought we'd use Menti because then it kind of gives you guys um, some kind of anonymity, and I feel like it will encourage you all to give it a go. Um, so let's make a start. So um, let's say you're in an OSCE or you're in real life and you're asked to speak to a gentleman on the phone. In general practice, you've never met this guy before. Um, he's very nice. So he's um, he's called Mr. Hughes and he's complaining of difficulty using his hands for the past couple of weeks, saying that they're swollen. The pain is worse at the start of the day. He does not have any long term medical conditions, takes no regular medications, um, has a significant smoking history, but that's about it. He denies anything else, um, like changes in his bowel habit or mouth ulcers or skin changes. Um, so I guess like to start off with what specific, what further questions would you ask this guy in an OSCE, given that you can't look at how he walks, you can't look at his hands in person, so, like what kind of stuff would you ask? Like what does he mean exactly by the pain and the swelling? So is it like the whole digit that's swollen? Is it limited to one digit? Is it like multiple digits with both hands? Um, yeah. And yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's basically characterizing what they mean because people can be quite unspecific. Um, and so, yeah, good, um, good overall, like, so you, you were basically what you were saying was like, is this stiffness someone's getting or is it pain? Is it limitation of movement or is it just pain limiting it? Because those are quite different things. Um, and then Sylvia's put on the chat any other joint pain. So, yeah, like he's mentioned his hands. So he got, you know, problems with his knees, his shoulders, his feet as well, which are like often neglected. Um, and then yeah like visible swellings of the joints because people can get pain with the absence of swelling as well and then yeah is it worse with use or is it um relieved by use is good so overall you can kind of split these into s's like if you forget and you want a kind of good you know performer of things to ask so do they get stiffness how long for is it symmetrical or non-symmetrical because that really that's a very good clue about what's going on um, small joints or large joints, and then the speed of onset. So he's told you that he is stiff for over an hour every morning. This is like very disabling for him, um, but it does improve with his with his work. So um, let's say like he's a mechanic. So um, he finds that once he starts working, he does feel better. Um, it's kind of a symmetrical swelling of his hands. They're visibly swollen and red. So he says they're kind of over his knuckles, his wrists are involved, and this has only kind of come up over the past two weeks out of the blue. Okay, so um, what is the most likely diagnosis? So in SBAs, they give you hardly any details, and obviously in real life, you'd ask for a photo, you'd ask to see him, but like what would be your, what would be the most likely differential for this gentleman? Yeah, so rheumatoid arthritis. And so that's because, yeah, he's got the symmetrical joint involvement. He's got a significant smoking history as well. And it's just the most likely for his age group and his and his sex. But we'll come on to that further. So rheumatoid arthritis, in general, it's it's thought to be a genetic susceptibility plus environmental factors. I'd say like just take the kind of salient points from this, like what I cover today, like you could go into great detail like Anush and I do in our spare time. But um, I think just taking the key points. So there's a couple of HLA markers. It's mostly like driven by T cells and TNF. And so that's kind of the role of the biologics is to target that therapy wise. So it's more common in women before the menopause, which might suggest kind of an estrogen led component. But the main kind of risks are uh, significant smoking history, a preceding of infection is sometimes postulated. And then dental hygiene is quite a big one because, so we'll come on to it, but like one of the key antibodies is to do with like um, dental hygiene and smoking have this kind of role in creating these antibodies, but it's totally nerdy. So like we won't, we won't quite go into it. Um, 
And so, yeah, so the blood test, the main antibodies would be your rheumatoid factor and your like anti-citrullinated peptide. And so the citrullinated peptide is something that can be stimulated by smoking and by infections. And then um, you'd consider a chest X-ray in these individuals because they can get rheumatoid nodules of the lungs. They can get um, something called Kaplan syndrome, which is where they get interstitial lung disease plus a bit of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so it is quite a multi-systemic disorder. Like, does anyone know kind of the main cause of death in these patients if they're left untreated? Yeah, so ischemic heart disease. So yeah, cardiovascular disease is like a massive um, cause of mortality in kind of most patients, to be honest, with autoimmune disease. Because yeah, they have just chronic inflammation. They can be prone to thromboses. And also, if you think about it, sort of, just from a kind of, you know, a sensible point of view, like if your joints are rubbish, you're not going to be moving about as much, you know, that they have a lot of, you know, they have very sedentary lifestyles if they, you know, can't move their joints because of pain. And so they kind of get this secondary, all these secondary problems that go along with the inactivity as well, as well as like this intrinsic inflammation as well. Does anyone know so there's a picture here which is illustrating like the joint involvement in rheumatoid. Does anyone know kind of like what these what these performers are called? That might be it's something that people use to um, look at kind of disease activity in these patients. So yeah, it's DAS28. So it's looking at 28 joints and you basically just draw in the ones that are involved. And so you can basically tell if your treatment's working or if it's not. So I'm not going to really like go massively over the numbers, but basically you're looking for either, you know, quite a high baseline to kind of hit it, hit it hard with treatment, or you're looking for like, if, is your treatment actually working? So you're getting a good response. To be honest, in practice, I think you mostly just go off like how you've seen the patient before. You know, are they walking much better? Are they telling, are they happier in general? Like often these patients more come in in just a complete mood change, you know, they just feel a lot better in themselves, they're less plagued by the pain. And so kind of for you, you're seeing quite a good clinical benefit, even if like the score of this would be, you know, if you're still seeing visible swelling, um, you might go off more what the patient's telling you. It's also, it's also worth pointing out that you score less for big joints uh, on the DAS28 because rheumatoid generally doesn't affect big joints. So a small joint will score closer to 0.5 or 1, but like a big joint will score like 0.1. Um, that's the only other way, the thing worth knowing. Yeah, cool, cool. Okay, so we have a picture of, um, these aren't his hands because his hands would not be in like quite this bad <laughs> at this point. So this is someone who's had rheumatoid for probably 30 odd years was probably of the era where there were limited treatments. So they've got very advanced disease. So you're in an OSCE, they give you this photo, it's surprisingly good quality. Um, and so um, let the, like, how would you describe what you're seeing? Because they, they, you're only gonna get one mark for saying it's likely rheumatoid, but like, how would you describe the signs on this image? You'd never, you'd never get a qual image this good quality in an exam, like absolutely 0% chance. Yep. So inflammation of the MCP joints. So yeah, especially on like their right hand, like they're very swollen MCP joints, which is very characteristic for rheumatoid. Um, there's yeah ulnar deviation at the wrist. So the fingers also at the MCPs. So they're kind of going like that, which is kind of like chronic subluxation is very characteristic of rheumatoid. Um, and then um, yeah, so there's some nodules um and yeah fixed flexion so overall like you could say this is grossly symmetrical deformity yes they look a bit different but like both sides are affected so we'd go for subluxation for symmetrical subluxation and subluxation just means kind of like slight dislocation of the joints um and then yeah like some some of the joints are affected more than others so we've got prominent mcp swelling what would you call kind of these nodes that are on 
this area so if they weren't rheumatoid nodules like what would you call these nodes yes yeah, so, um do, i think bashard bashard so boutonniere is like on here is a deformity that's on here but the the actual nodes of the proximals are called bashard's nodes enough a good friend of mine told me that the way he remembered it was that her burden's nodes are of the distal interphalangeal joints because they're like it sounds like hebrides like outer hebrides that they're really north so if that helps maybe it just makes it worse to be honest but yeah bouchard and then burden's nodes so you could go with that put the ulnar deviation and then yeah someone mentioned boutonniere deformity so that's where you've got flexion of the proximal the proximal joint with hyperextension of the distal so it kind of looks like this and then swan necking, which this person doesn't convincingly have. So I got this photo and I kind of like to just draw around things is where you've got the opposite. So you've got hyperextension of the I'm trying to do it on my own fingers, hyperextension of the proximal joint. And then it's kind of got that little like head on it is like how I think about it. Um, and these are the big features of rheumatoid. And then um, you can kind of still see patients with this actually. I so saw a lady the other day. This can basically cause very, very dramatic um, joint destruction. And you think about like, you know, they can't make a cup of tea, they can't do up their blouse, like all the rest of it. So it's very disabling. And I think what differentiates this from other joint disorders is if when you look at the hands, because a colleague of mine mistook it for a type of psoriatic, is that they're not actually shortened the, the digits themselves it's just the joints are so displaced that it makes them look really short but they're actually just kind of a bit uh they kind of just appear quite mangled to be honest but we're seeing less and less of this because we're getting better at treating it okay so rheumatoid is not all joints so does anyone know what these kind of extra articular features are of, rheum of rheumatoid So does anyone know what the middle picture is? It's kind of come up before, but we kind of, it got mentioned in the hands. So yeah, that's a rheumatoid nodule. So elbows and hands are like the, the most common sites for these. So it is worth, worth feeling them. They're kind of, I, I don't know if you'd agree, Anoush, kind of quite hard, but not like, not major and quite fixed. Yeah, they're, they're like, they're like a harder lipoma, right? Yeah. Basically, that is how I describe them. Try and feel some. I mean, that sounds weird. Um, and then, so my image on the left isn't like particularly clear, but this lady's basically um, complaining of like gritty, gritty eyes and a dry mouth. Yeah, so it's sicker syndrome. So people with, sh so it's not Sjogren's. Sjogren's is kind of its own little thing. Has some, you know, there is some crossover and like room, what you learn about rheumatology is it's kind of what one of the professors describes as like clouds, clouds of diagnoses. You know, there's overlap, there's a spectrum. But basically, if you see dry eyes and dry mouth in the context of another rheumatological condition it's called sicker syndrome so it's just dry eyes dry mouth um any sort of any mucosal surface can be dry whereas Sjogren's is its own specific entity and we're not we haven't gone into it today it's got specific antibodies so like anti ro anti la um but yeah just make sure you don't get them too mixed up quite similar to be honest but um yeah in the context of in, in the context of this is sicker to be right. fair, the people writing your exams realistically will get them confused too. <laughs> so the right one does look like an ulcer, but um, and like to be fair, like you could think that. I guess the the what the, the thing about where it is gives you a bit of an indication as well. So if it was a venous ulcer, you'd expect it on the medial aspect of the leg, like where the great saphenous is. If it was arterial, it could kind of be anywhere. It could be along here, but it doesn't look punched out. It looks quite varied, actually. And then pressure also, it's not really, I mean, unless they sort of had really strange boots or something. 
like it's not really the right area it would be more for a pressure ulcer or a diabetic ulcer you'd be thinking like the base of the base of the foot and the toes um clear borders yeah it does suggest arterial yeah um and so this is pyoderma gangrenosum so jordan was right and jordan like what made you think it was pyoderma which is rheumatoid is the most common cause of actually you you learn about it more in gastro with uc and crohn's but um rheumatoid is like the most common the most common So basically, the reason that you'd think that it was pyoderma is it's got this kind of purpley blue, yeah, and I guess process of elimination, but it's got, if you can see, it's got this purpley blue border around it. And I've deliberately picked one that wasn't, probably maybe wasn't as obvious. If you look it up, you'll see it's got this quite characteristic border. Um, and it forms this kind of crib reform scar, so it's kind of got like lots and lots of lots of lesions in and amongst basically so and then it basically exhibits something called pathogy so maybe this is more of a year five topic but essentially it will form at the sites of minimal trauma so the way that they treat this is not via surgery they don't touch it because it makes it worse and if someone with rheumatoid or crohn's or ulcerative colitis underwent surgery they could be at risk of like forming one of these at the site. So if they had, you know, some some other surgery to their leg, they could form these. Um, and so those are the associations. Like I, I would personally learn them. I think it's kind of fair game as a derm manifestation in fourth year. Um, and then yeah, other other things that um, people can get, which is worth asking, it's always worth asking about Raynaud's. So you can just say, do your fingers go blue, blue or red or white in the cold? And then there's a there's sweet syndrome, which is not going to come up, but essentially they can get this kind of really horrific blistering rash across their body, um, which is just like another complication of rheumatoid. So it's really not just joints. Okay, cool. Right, we're on to menti. So it should work. Um, so if you go on to Menti, um, so this is the question. So you start, evidently, I forgot that his name was Mr. Hughes, but you start the same patient on a medication um, for his rheumatoid and you conduct follow-up blood tests and you're worried that his liver function has gone a bit AWOL. Um, what is the most likely agent you started him on? Also, while you're answering that, does anyone know any other ophthalmological complications of rheumatoid? There's always budding ophthalmologists in like every year group. It's always so strange. Not uveitis. Um, it can happen, but it, UV, the more common, yeah. Okay, three of three of you have answered. Like, oh, four or five. Oh, exciting. Okay, and this um, is why, like, I'm glad that we're, we're doing Menti because, like, honestly, like, the drug re drug side effects are really, really hard to, you know, there's lots of them to learn, and it's good that we've caught quite a good split. And this is obviously a two-part two, two part question. You've got to know what's the most likely drug they'd give this person and what's the side, you know, does the side effect fit? Okay, cool. We have seven, so I feel like I'm just going to roll with it. So the correct answer oof, was methotrexate. So methotrexate is one of the first line agents for rheumatoid arthritis. It's an antifolate agent and it they vary very commonly. So you do liver function tests before you start it. You test it a couple of weeks after and you stop it if it goes too high because it's a quite a it quite commonly can cause hepatitis obviously not full blown if you monitor it and you stop the drug but they're very cautious about using it because it's antifolate is also linked with bone marrow suppression and kind of like rheumatoid so rheumatoid can cause lung fibrosis but so can the treatment methotrexate so sometimes they'll get a chest x-ray to make sure that you're not sort of starting from a poor baseline um um and um 
Hydroxychloroquine is another slightly, maybe it's a bit, it's a first line for rheumatoid, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's first line for most, most practice, but it's very rare to get acute um, hepatic injury with that. We'll go into like what that causes in a bit. Um, azathioprine, again, like unlikely to be the, the first one to start. It's usually like methotrexate and sulfasalazine are the first two. And then infliximab, so they have to fail two conventional drugs before they move on to a biologic, so onto the monoclonal antibodies. So it's unlikely that I, in a sort of, you know, first first presentation would have started them on that because you just can't get the funding basically there's kind of no real other justification it's just money and then um naproxen is like always fair game in the exam so the big ones gi ulceration cardiovascular complications and you wouldn't do it if they currently have an aki okie dokie so i'm just like slightly struggling with moving one, two. Okay, right. Wait, like leave the menti for a bit. We're just going to run through the treatments for for rheumatoid. So in any OSCE, like when they ask you the treatment of something, always just start off like conservative medical and surgical if it's applicable, but we won't do it in this case. So conservative, you want them to stop smoking. It makes it worse. You can give them a steroid injection to take the heat off it, but it's unlikely to change the disease course. And you can recommend some NSAIDs for pain relief. But like there's overall, this was, you know, never going to stop the disease progression. And so then we start with methotrexate. We've covered the um, side effects of methotrexate. The next one's sulfasalazine. Then there's hydroxychloroquine. And then there's biologics if they fail any of the two of the three of these, basically. So does anyone know any side effects of these ones that are more specific. Also, just one other thing: you have to have tried methotrexate before you start a biologic. You can't get funding otherwise. So one of the two DMARs has to be methotrexate. So yeah, Sylvia. So oligospermia. So it's it's luckily reversible. So if you put men on it and they want to start a family, they can like switch off it. But it's definitely something to think about. Um, yeah, definitely. Does anyone know like which one makes um, your like your um, your secretions go kind of yellowy orange? I've sort of made a bit of a clue on the side, to be honest. Um, yeah, so sulfasalazine. So it's like quite an interesting one um, that it does slightly change your secretions a bit. So it is worth warning patients about. Um, hydroxychloroquine. Yeah, the big one is eyes. So they get routine eye checkups. And then, yeah, biologics, which is like the reactivation of TB. So obviously these aren't like exhaustive because like they can cause anything under the sun, basically. But the common ones are things like GI upset, also retinopathy for hydroxychloroquine. But hydroxychloroquine in general is a very safe drug. It's one that they commonly put, leave patients on because it's very well tolerated um, and it doesn't have like the same side effect profile as like methotrexate and sulfasalazine. And then, yeah, biologics. The main one is the reactivation of um, latent um, infections. So they'll commonly test people for like hepatitis B and C t and do a chest X-ray for TB. Cool. OK, so back to Menti. I hope it like works. Do let me know if it doesn't. Um, so. You decide to continue as methotrexate because it went up a bit and then it's kind of chilled out on the lower dose um, and you wish to advise him which medications can interact with methotrexate, which of the following is not true, like which one is not a true interaction? And this one is like, really hard and they'd more likely give you like which one is the true one so i feel like not putting one of these ones that is very 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 much true is like an achievement in itself um oh we've got like quite a good split Okay, cool, cool. So we've got like a really big split here. 
um, for all of them apart from alcohol. Um, and so the incorrect answer is allopurinol. Does anyone who got that right tell me which which one of the um, uh, DMARDs is like an absolute disaster with um, allopurinol, unless you kind of fiddle around with dosage? Is it azathioprine? Yeah, so it's azathioprine. So that's kind of one of the big ones is that if you give someone, they both act by the same pathway or are oh, new to remind me, which one is it one potentiates the other? TPM, uh, thiopurine methyl transferase, allopurinol inhibits that and, uh, and azathioprine um, is metabolized by that. Uh, that's the primary action of allopurinol. It's a xanthine oxidase inhibitor, but it also inhibits uh, thiopurine methyl transferase. It's like not an intentional effect. So you do basically get the the blood dyscrasia with if you take these two together. And to be honest, like at our level, like you just wouldn't prescribe them together. It's only kind of very um, experienced consultants that would like quarter the dose of one of them. You know, there's very nuanced prescribing, but essentially those two together are bad news. So the rest are true to an extent. So you would not really like someone who's kind of boozing a lot to be on methotrexate because that's just upping the risk of hepatotoxicity. So that is something to bear in mind. Atorvastatin as well, but it's all risk benefit. And to be honest, lots of patients are totally fine on these combos. Um, the big one that kills patients is trimethoprim. So it's someone who's been on methotrexate for years, switches GP, has a UTI, gets put on trimethoprim and they've had patients die from this. So they get complete bone marrow failure. Um, and so that's that's the one to remember is like you never put trimethoprim and methotrexate together because trimethoprim, methotrexate are both folate antagonists. And so you basically just don't produce any blood cells. And then there is a slight risk with like the varicella zoster vaccine. Um, and so the varicella zoster vaccine is one of the live attenuated vaccines. So what are the other ones? This is more in the context of biologics, is that these vaccines are contraindicated in patients and they've again had patients die if they're given these. And so it's it's worth thinking about because I mean, soon everyone's gonna be traveling again and patients need to know which vaccines they can and can't, can't have. Um, so, sorry. So yeah, yellow fever is one. Yeah, yellow fever is a live one. Yep, the MMR vaccine. Yep, nasal flu, BCG. Yeah, yeah, nice. So yeah, there's um there's a few to learn basically, but those are the main ones. And so they can get reactivation. Okay, cool, right. So we're on to the next one. I'm gonna have to like speed up a bit, but so you've got a 32 year old lady that comes to see you in A&E. She's been feeling extremely fatigued over the past few weeks with accompanying joint pains and a rash when she goes out in the sun. The joints become most affect, um, the joints most affected are her hands and her wrists, and she gets morning stiffness of over an hour. Given the most likely diagnosis, which antibody would be most indicative of the underlying condition? I'm going to give you guys like 10 more seconds, like three, like, yeah, pick, pick one. It doesn't also matter. This, also, like this question emphasizes that you really need to learn antibodies for exams because it's free marks. It's and also like read the question properly, because like I'm totally the person that doesn't read. It's like a oh, very yeah. nuanced in like the last sentence. OK, so we've got five of you. There's a split. So some have said ANA, some have said anti double stranded and some of them have someone has said Smith. So whoever said Smith, you're a winner, baby. So um, anti Smith is the most specific antibody for lupus. So the majority of people with lupus have an ANA positive, but a lot of other people are ANA positive and don't have lupus. So it's again, this sensitivity versus specificity. Um, and so not everyone has anti-Smith, but if you have anti-Smith, you've got lupus basically. 
And then double-stranded DNA is only like slightly less specific, but it's still very specific. So to be honest, none of you said, an anti you know, none of you fell into, you, you didn't do the anti-CCP and the rheumatoid factor. So I think it's just all about reading the question. Are they after the one that is positive in the most people or are they after the specific one? But yeah. Okay, so cool, lupus. Lupus, it's never lupus. Um, so you can read up a bit in your own time about like why they think lupus occurs, but essentially it's a, um, essentially it's an autoimmune condition, which is thought to be due to this kind of defective clearance of cells. You start making antibodies towards the, the, the um, nuclear receptors of the cells and you get basically destruction of your own tissues. It's most common in black and Asian populations. And I think I, I definitely didn't clock that because every time you Google malar rash, it comes up with, you know, the most perfect rash on very fair skinned people. Whereas there is something to bear in mind that that isn't the most um, common population for it to exist in. Um, the female to male ratio is like definitely in favor of women. Um, men have actually more, a more severe picture, quite interestingly, like with the renal manifestation. So it's definitely not something to rule out with any of the, with any condition, just because it's more common in one race than another, one um, sex than another, like do always think about it. And these signs can be much more subtle um, on darker skin. So it is definitely something to look up is how they, how they look in different people. Um, the blood results that you should do for lupus. So um, I'm actually going to go over this in another slide. So I think I'm just going to move on because I've got it on a separate thing. So these are the skin manifestations. Some of these photos have the same thing on them. So they're like repeats, but it's just to kind of labor the point of variety. So the woman on the far left, what would what would you say she's got? Or like any of them, just like roll with it. There's kind of three main things that they get skin wise. So yeah, this lady on the left has a malar rash. So yeah, butterfly distribution, and it's so it's fixed erythema, flat or raised, and it spares the nasolabial fibers is the key bit of info. You know, if you're in an OSCE, saying the spares the nasolabial folds would be like spot on. And then discoid is literally the same but it's more to do with the fact that it's got this raised um, scaling. So you can see that they've got this scale in the, um, like here as well, and it can go on the lips even as well. And this is a very disfiguring rash, especially in people who have more pigment, it can cause depigmentation, it can go into the scalp, it can cause hair loss. And so this can be quite a very upsetting condition for people to have. Um, and yeah, this um, lady in the bottom right also has it, and it just shows that they get this hyperpigmentation, and then the um, and then they can kind of get like permanent discoloration of their skin. Okay, so the same person with lupus comes in, and there isn't a um, menti on this, but they have this hand abnormality, and um, and joint pains, and you ask them to put their hands together and they can flatten them. Does anyone know what this manifestation is of lupus? And it's, I want to say French. I want to say the person's fr like Anouche, French. Uh, um, I don't know, but <laughs> probably. <laughs> it's, so it's eponymous. Don't cry, but it's eponymous. <laughs> and it's a problem with like the ligaments. So it's not boutonnieres, so it does look like boutonnieres, and this would distinguish it. So boutonnieres, they wouldn't be able to flatten their hands. It's not deboitrins. Deboitrins is like the tendon thickening here, so they end up with like a finger like this. Ugh, too many eponymous ones. <laughs> no, too many fancy names, you know, like yeah. part is not. To be fair, name. yeah, you might not. Oh, you have heard of it. Jacudes, yeah. jacudes, yeah. I don't know, maybe French, I don't know. But so Jacques arthropathy is where they get um, subluxation of the joints, but it's not a problem with the joints themselves. It's to do with like the the ligaments around them. So you do an X-ray and they've got these kind of deviations, but like the bones themselves are healthy, like they're fine. Um, 
And so, yeah, you get them, their hands are like this, you ask them to put their hands together and they can flatten them. And so that's jacuz. Um, it's not completely eponymous to, um, to lupus. It can appear in other connective tissue disorders, but it's quite a good sign for lupus. Okie dokie. So I've completely messed this up because I haven't put in the right animation. Sad times. So for those of you that love like, um, who love acronyms, like Soap Brain MD is the one for lupus. Anusha shaking his head, like, but I think it helps some people, so it's fine. And so this is like all the ma manifestations of lupus. So I've I've kicked off with um, pleuritis, pericolitis, and Libman Sachs. I'm going to kind of leave that there for you guys to read up on. But essentially, these patients can come in very breathless. Um, does anyone know what O stands for? So that's something kind of a continuation on from the skin manifestations that they can have. So it's not ocular. It's something like in their mouth. Yeah, so oral ulcers. So these are typically like non-painful ulcers that you should ask. So in any room history, they're like, do you have ulcers? Do you have like any changes in your bowels? Do you have any rashes? Like those are the kind of things they ask everyone because they're kind of like, oh yeah, I've got, you know, two mouth ulcers. Okay, cool. Um, does anyone know what, oh, A, I'm just going to do it. arthritis. That's just, yeah. Um, and then what have we got? Photosensitivity. So that malar rash typically occurs over the face because your face is the most exposed, but they can also have um, photosensitive rashes on their arms, on their chest. So it is worth exposing the patient properly and having a look. Um, and then B, so blood, as I had on the other side, just because I'm I'm racing through this because it's not like the most interesting bit really. Um, so they can have anemia, thrombocytopenia, and leukopenia. So it is worth doing that. And then it basically causes anything in the kidney. Now I could probably get showered out by you know a nephrologist for that, but essentially lupus causes almost any type of glomerular nephritis. So it's always quite fair game. And this is an, another quite common cause of mortality and morbidity in these patients is that they get lupus nephritis. So they're checked for proteinuria and hematuria as well. And then, yeah, they're only positive, as I said before, and then they've got these specific antibodies. And you also check for antiphospholipid as well, because there's an association. Um, does anyone know what the neurological manifestations are? So like broadly, because this can be something people present with is more than neurology side. Yeah, so psychosis. So there have been people that present with psychosis and seizures. Um, and so it is definitely something to think about. And then we go throw them on steroids and then they get even more psychosis. And then something to bear in mind that you can ask about in the history, there is obviously an association between some people have lupus plus antiphospholipid. And so it's worth asking um, about kind of previous thromboses as well, previous miscarriages, previous problems in pregnancy. And then it puts them at greater risk of um, atherosclerotic disease and um, hyperlipidemia. So it is something to bear in mind. And this can be a common thing that you know, they don't think anything of it and they think, oh, actually, I've been trying to have children for years and it can be a really, really distressing condition to have for people. So um, the treatment, does anyone, so you've got someone with lupus, like how do you think we, how do you think we treat it? So what would we do conservatively, like first? Everyone's probably like, why has she got, why has she got that photo up? I'm, I'm getting to it, I'm getting to it. But um, like, what would you what would you tell someone that has those that stuff going on to do? Yeah, so stop smoking. That can just add add fuel to the fire. Yeah. Um, sunblock. Yeah. So the main one is like you know reducing your time out in the sun. Um, using sunscreen, hats, that kind of stuff. Um, 
and then advising them over future pregnancy. So I'm going to go on to it, but some of the drugs that we use are not suitable for pregnancy. Um, it's also useful to get the lupus very under control to then have a successful pregnancy because they can often flare during pregnancy. Um, and then cardiovascular risk reduction. So like all your kind of usual stuff um, and just evaluating if they need any statins, any beta blockers, that kind of stuff. And then our medications wise, um, we give them high dose steroid. We use cyclophosphamide, which is um, very effective. To be honest, like you don't have to learn like all of the kind of all of the um, mechanisms for these things, but those are kind of the general ones that are used. Um, and it's definitely something to bear in mind that like most of these drugs are not safe in pregnancy. And so for women with lupus, where you want their want their lupus to be very under control, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a nightmare actually. It's a bit of a catch twenty two. Like a lot of these medications are great, but you can't have them in pregnancy. So a lot of them are teratogens. Um, cyclophosphamide is a chemotherapy agent. It's also used for cancers. Um, azathioprine is just going to mess up DNA synthesis. And biologics, they just don't have enough data because women are very much excluded from clinical trials and let alone pregnant women. But there is some nuance with biologics in that some clinicians will allow it because they see that the risk, you know, to the fetus and to the mother of having active lupus is, or an autoimmune condition is completely outweighed by the risk of possible harm to the fetus. Because for some things like rituximab, they're not really seeing the rates of um, teratogenic effects. Um, like it's not much higher than sort of general population, really. Okay, dokie. So other patterns of joint disease. So you've got um, a 70 year old gentleman who comes in and on the left. So he's the guy on the left with his hand and his hand X-ray. Um, does anyone know what this is? So he's got an asymmetric, um, he's got an asymmetric arthritis affecting um, affecting his hands. Um, he used to be a carpenter. Yeah, so osteoarthritis. So yeah, there's the um, squaring of the base of the thumb. He's got some Heberden's nodes and some, if you, yeah, on the um, first and second digits. And then he's got um, Bouchard's as well. And then, yeah, if they've got sort of a manual labor job, typing, that kind of stuff, they're more at risk. The one in the middle is, let's say, a 30 year old gentleman that comes in with an excruciating, red hot, painful joint. What's our first thing we've got to knock off the list? So yeah, septic arthritis. So always think that for an exam, always think that in real life. What would be our other differentials of a, someone coming in with just one painful joint? So yeah, re I haven't put reactive arthritis, but yeah, reactive arthritis would be one, gout, pseudo gout, and yeah, they've just, you know, whacked it on something or like had a motor vehicle accident or something. Cool, and then you've got a, 35 year old man who comes in with persistent swellings in his toes and he sends you this picture on the e-consult form what are you thinking about so it's not gal I can kind of like I kind of get it but it'd probably be quite red so yeah I'm thinking psoriatic arthritis so this is like dactylitis um, so swelling of like the, the and it can happen in the toes so it's something to like think about is that some people's predominant picture can be in their feet not their hands so yeah asymmetric for psoriatic as well cool so psoriatic arthritis it's one of the sera negatives um and we can go over those more in like another session i'm very conscious that like i should really be passing over to anoush um so we'll do that next time. And so they get the dactylitis or the sausage fingers. Um, they get breakdown of their nails. They get um, they have associations with stuff like vitiligo and type one diabetes. And it's always worth looking at the scalp as well as the extensive surfaces for psoriasis because those places are often missed, so like behind the ears, along the scalp as well. But we'll go through. We can go through those another time. Um, 
And then does anyone know, this is just the SBA kind of like, what is this present, you know, this um, x-ray finding on psoriasis, which like, I just totally didn't get what they meant for honestly forever. So yeah, oh, you guys better than me. Um, pencil and cup uh, abnormality. So I had to look up, like, I remember when I was doing it, like what this actually looks like. And so that is it for reference. So pencil and cup is psoriatic arthritis and they get shortening of the shortening of the digits okay i'm gonna pass over to anish okay cool so we're gonna talk about how rheumatology overlaps with like general medicine because i think it's like one of the two like general specialties as i'm sure i've fangled about before but we'll start off with this case and joan seems to be quite a popular word today um 52 year old lady presenting with a bilateral leg 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 weakness and she's struggling to go up and down the stairs at her job what is the differential diagnosis for this okay myositis considering this is a rheumatology talk yes so if let's go with categories first what categories of conditions this is a big differential because she's effectively got proximal muscle weakness yeah so there, there are neurological causes Neeraj has given us an inflammatory cause what else yeah neuromuscular uh, issues what else Endocrine problems, absolutely. Malignancies could do it because they generally cause wasting and they can also cause things like Cushing's. So by different mechanisms, it could be that. Um, anything else? Infective causes, yeah. Grain barre, metabolic, yeah. Neurological, yeah. They could have spinal cord compression. So the takeaway is this is a very important and very broad differential diagnosis and this is like this is a massive diagram just to remind you that like any presentation can have like a million different causes these are the some uh, some that i came up with don't forget about things like lyme we talked uh, this is likely myositis considering the context of this talk metabolic things hypo and hyperthyroidism which one of those is painful and one of those is painless do you know which one's which you have a 50 50 chance of getting this right Uh, I think it's the other way around. I think hypothyroidism is painful and hyperthyroidism is painless, but Izzy will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, and then even something like diabetes can cause lots of muscle wasting around the uh, thigh. And it, like patients will often complain that like their trousers don't fit in like, but it's weird because none of the sizes really help. Um, it's not really a size issue. It's just the fact that they've got very specific patterns of muscle loss. And never forget about drugs. Drugs we give lots of patients. So any drugs that can cause rhabdo or any cause of rhabdo, like statins, steroids, which rheumat yes, absolutely, rheumatology love their steroids, and they can induce this in lots of their patients. And it's also worth considering all the causes of false weakness. So things that cause pain. Yeah. God, it's like, you just read my mind. PMR is like a very big cause of false weakness. So they're very, they're in a lot of pain when they move, so they're not gonna try very hard. So it feels like they're weak, but if you if you get them to push through the pain or give them adequate analgesia, they are able to do it. Other causes of false weakness, thinking a bit more holistically about a patient. Chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, absolutely. And alongside that, yeah, depression is a, is, is, is an important cause. Uh, also OA, because it's painful. Yeah, very good. So remember, very broad differential for something, something that seems quite simple. Um, there are 
we're talking about myositis. There are three main signs associated with dermatomyositis, which is the diagnosis we're about to talk about. Can anyone name these signs? Sure sign is the one on the left. Gotron's papules is the one bottom right, and yeah, the heliotrope rash. So when you see red bilateral, like almost red slash purple rash around someone's eyes, what other conditions do you want to be thinking about that we've spoken about previously? There's a bit of like there's a there's some repeated content in this lecture because um, there's like some important stuff that is worth revising. So if you've got like almost like bruising around your eyes. It could be a heliotrope rash. What else could it be? It's two other things it could be. <laughs> Not what I was going for, but I'm sure it could be. Uh, base, base of skull fracture, yeah. So it could be like, yeah, basal skull fracture is very important to think of. Uh, RA generally wouldn't cause this, no. Uh, and then, like, there's w there's one other differential for, like, raccoon eyes, as Yusuf has described it. Tired. Yes, me, probably. No, I'm actually okay. The other one is, like, amyloidosis can cause, like, raccoon eyes. Um, it can also look a bit similar, a bit similar to this. Yeah, big sad for me. Um, dermatomyositis. Inflammatory proximal myopathy can be isolated. Yes, amyloidosis. And you're like, oh, yeah, it's a really niche condition. Um, we had three questions on amyloid in finals, and we, everyone got all of them wrong. Well, guess got them right. Yeah, it's bizarre. We didn't uh, have for our fourth yet, though, so don't go into, like, a panic and spend, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Final, finals, time, finals question. Time. Yeah, finals questions are a lot more random than fourth year questions. Fourth year questions are quite predictable. Um, so you can get like a primary dermatomyositis or it might be associated with other connective tissue disorders. Yes, it's Omar. Are you happy birthday, Omar? Um, what kind of investigations would you do for dermatomyositis? ANA is always a great shout in in any kind of uh, inflammatory condition. CK is very sensitive. Biopsy is very specific. Good uh, good answers. What else? Yeah, biopsy and histology very good. Yeah. What else? Are there any specific te uh, like biochemical tests we can do? Yeah, that there are specific autoantibodies that are definitely worth learning again. Yeah, anti me too and anti Joe one. Here's an SBA. We're going to go back to Menti. Uh, Izzy, have you put these on Menti as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on Menti. Oh my God. So, up yeah. now. Oh, so prepared, unlike me. Given this patient's likely diagnosis, which of these investigations is the most important one to organize? Here is a question that comes up a dispro disproportionate amount, considering it's not that common a condition. OK, we have four people. That's fine. What have, what have they gone for? Five. So um, four have gone for CK, and two have gone for CT chest abdo pelvis. OK, so this. Note the word most important. The correct answer is CT, chest, abdo, pelvis. Um, the answer, the, the reason for this is, right, D-dimer doesn't add anything to this. Uh, CK, you know that they have like a myositis of some sort, like it's going to be raised regardless. It's, it's a very sensitive test. It's not very specific, doesn't really add anything. Complement C3, Again, should it's not really implicated so much in uh, dermatomyositis. The problem with dermatomyositis in adults is the fact that it is up to 40% of the time it is paraneoplastic due to an underlying malignancy. So that narrows down your answers to mammogram or CT chest abdo pelvis. So commonly what they will do 
is uh, do something known as hunt the carcinoma of unknown primary or hunt the unknown cancer. Uh, and they'll do a CT chest abdo pelvis. What they will also organize is a colonoscopy um, and potentially a chest x-ray. So what are the three big cancers that cause paraneoplastic dermatomyositis? I've given away two of them. Yeah, lung cancer, colorectal can cancer, and the other one was also on that slide. <laughs> Yeah, breast cancer. The the fourth one is probably ovarian cancer. Um, breast, oh, colorectal is less common than ovarian. I checked this yesterday, actually, and which is why I changed it, but I didn't change it in my head. <laughs> Good. So remember, if you see dermatomyositis in an adult, you need to look for uh, cancer uh, in like if you're at a tertiary center, they'll probably do PET CT because it's quite good. Um, back to her next question. Mrs. Jones is diagnosed with anti jo one positive dermatomyositis. What is the most important complication of this condition? Also, interestingly, dermatomyositis in kids is never associated with malignancy, which is good for them. Not that that's ever coming up in exams, just something I learned today. So we've got four responses. We've got one for acute tubular necrosis and we've got three for interstitial lung disease. The majority of you are correct. Uh, the answer is interstitial lung disease. Pancreatitis, not really associated, oh God, why have I moved slides? Um, not really associated with dermatomyositis, more with like, like the vasculitis type processes. Hepatitis uh, tends to go along with other connective tissue diseases uh, or in, in its own self, like autoimmune hepatitis. Marrow failure can technically happen with anything, but it's more like a cancer type thing. Acute tubular necrosis is actually completely random, and I just put it on because it sounded legit and I knew someone would go for it. Sorry. Uh, and yeah, so there's this thing known as antisynthetase syndrome, where you get dermatomyositis and interstitial lung disease, goes along with Joe one antibodies. Anyone know what the sign in the hands is called? You're looking at the middle of the fingers. You might have heard of this. You might not have heard of this. It's one of those things you, it's worth knowing one word about. Yeah, so it does look like acanthosis, doesn't it? Um, but this is in, in this context, this is called mechanics hands and it's part of this antisynthetase syndrome. Um, but yeah, it's so the interstitial lung disease is actually very important because that's what causes the massive reduction in quality of life and it can lead to like significant mortality um, as well as the underlying cancer. Uh, fine, next one. Unrelated, patient presents a shortness of breath, dry cough and the following signs. What, what imaging would confirm the diagnosis? This I've is a question. A I've got a mentee. So if you type You've it on, let's go. OK. I don't um, know how long you yeah um also it's worth pointing out that this um this question comes up like every year in as an sba but if you can answer it without an sba <laughs> that means you'll definitely get it right also it might say your answer's wrong if you sort of spell it I had to sort of guess how people would 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 write the answer. So um, yeah, what have people gone for so far? Oh, so we've got a bunch of people that went for chest X-ray and a bunch of people that went to for CT chest uh, CTPA. CTPA. So hmm. we've got three chest X-rays, one CTPA. Um, I'm intrigued about the CTPA. If that person doesn't mind writing in the chat why they thought that, because I'm just I'm genuinely intrigued because I feel like I might have missed something out when I was going writing this question. But chest X-ray is the right answer, because what is the diagnosis? You, you'll have to write in the chat now. Sorry. 
erythema nodosum, sarcoidosis, chest x-ray. And like uh, Dr. Bainan was saying that if you've got like, uh, what sign are you looking for on the chest x-ray before I tell you this really interesting statistic that's going to make you fall asleep? Yeah, bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy. Yeah, so bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy with erythema nodosum and um, those symptoms apparently is 99% sensitive for like, or it's specific for, for sarcoid or something nuts. And then like the remaining 1% is like TB. <laughs> uh with with like an atypical presentation without like weight loss or anything so yeah this is sarcoid sarcoidosis is this like it's a granulomatous condition causes it's more common in Africa than people again uh presents with like dry cough shortness of breath also I'm aware of time we'll finish in the next like six minutes sometimes they present with erythema nodosum I'm not going to go through the causes of erythema nodosum today because I want to go through some other causes of things. Chest x-ray sign for exams is bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy, and they love that. Treatment is immunosuppression, mainly through steroids. You don't really know anything past that. That's fine. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, what's the most, what, what blood tests would you do for someone with sarcoidosis? There's like two very important blood tests. Serum ACE is like diagnostic-ish, like it's the closest thing to like a non-tissue diagnosis. Yeah, you can do like ESR for like inflammation. Uh, calcium is very important because it's, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then this is one of the few things I think is worth learning for sarcoid. There are five indications for treating sarcoidosis and Four of these five indications are like one of them is high calcium. The other four are involvement of certain organs, because this is a multi system condition that can truly affect anything. And Yusuf has got it. Yeah. Uh, so in the eyes, you get a uveitis, usually anterior, but it can be any of uh, anywhere in the eye. So inflammation of the eye. Uh, how does it involve the lung? There's a specific way it involves the lung. And then, yeah, cardiac or neurosarcoid, you need to treat immediately as well. Um, in what way does it affect the lungs? Yeah, interstitial, far yeah, it causes an interstitial lung disease as well. So those are the five indications to treating sarcoid, the most important of which is hypercalcemia. Yeah, diffuse lung involvement causing interstitial lung disease. And like, this is a, just a very common exam topic. So what are the, how do you split up the causes of interstitial lung disease? I, I think I'm, I think we've done this before, but it comes up a lot. So we're going to do it again. <laughs> Idiopathic, great. Yeah, but how do we categorize the causes? You can do it, so you can do it based on like the underlying pathophysiology. You could do sec secondary versus primary. There's a more useful way of doing it. Yeah, upper versus lower zone is very, very good, a uh, very good way of doing it. So give me some causes of upper lung, upper lobe lung fibrosis. Angspon TB. Yeah, I have one other. I have two others on my list. Yeah, so any of the any of the industrial dust diseases. Although I think asbestos tends to be lower lung because it's because those are fibers are quite heavy. Uh, one other one other disease. <laughs> the one that we're talking about. Although it can be either. So sarcoid, yeah. And then causes of lower lung fibrosis. What are the important causes of lower lung fibrosis? Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is very important. The drugs, so uh, what important drugs cause pulmonary fibrosis? 
any connective tissue disease that we haven't talked about uh, that is doesn't cause upper limb fibrosis. So anything that is an angst bond or sarcoid will cause lower limb fibrosis. Important ones are amiodarone, important drugs are amiodarone, methotrexate, and nitrofurantoin, although there are other causes. Um, but yeah, bleomycin can also cause it, yep. So this is a very, very good list to know. And then like the other thing worth talking about briefly is like the important causes of hypercalcemia, which is again, another huge exam topic that comes up again and again. And Izzy knows this list off the back of her hand. So what, how, so what are the, yeah, so there, there are the big four and then the rest. So the big four are, yes, so cancers, specifically myeloma, but like any bone met from any cancers, sarcoid, yeah. Cancer is the second commonest on this list. Sarcoid is the rarest on this list. What's the common one? Yeah, hyperparathyroidism, primary or tertiary. And then some less important causes just to keep in mind, Addison's, vitamin D toxicity in mugs, like probably my mother who would take too much vitamin D. I think acromegaly can cause it, diuretics can cause it, depending on which ones, thiazides particularly can cause it. And I don't know why I put renal failure in less important, because renal failure is very important, it's just not one of the big four. Fine, very good. What's going on in these two images? Someone asked me this at the hospital this week, someone in your year. So I was like, I think we'll go over this. Don't cry because it's histology, please. Okay, so these are both granulomas. These are both granulomas, and they are infil they are in they are infiltrating granulomas because that's what granulomas do. They infiltrate a bit like cancers, but less rapidly. Don't cry, please don't cry, because this this might come up in your if this comes up, this is a free mark for you in your exam. One is caseating, and one one is non caseating. Which one is which? Is so, the one on the left non caseating? Yeah. The one on the left is non caseating, the one on the right is caseating. Yeah, and you can tell that because the one on the right, can you see this random? So, like the main cells in granulomas, so they have macrophages and then they have these pink lymphocytes, and then you have these clear spots that have kind of where there's no cells at all, and that's caseating necrosis. What condition, if you see a caseating granuloma, what is like the first condition you should think of? for exams, yeah, TB. There are other causes, but like the most important one for you to think of is tuberculosis. If you see non caseating granulomas, there are a number of different conditions it could be. Um, give me some. Crohn's, yeah. Sarcoid, yeah. Amyloid doesn't cause granulomas, it just causes amyloid deposition. So you'll get Congo, red staining, or you'll get like shiny stuff on ultrasound. Uh, anything else? Uh, what other? No, that's unlikely. No, it's, it's so granulomatosis with polyangitis, previously known as Wegener's, can cause non caseating granulomas and then giant cell arteritis causes granulomas too but yeah i mean the important ones tb versus sarcoid sarcoid on the left tb on the right it's one of those questions that the med school has in their bank that they reuse year on year it's it came up like three years in a row until it didn't come up last year so it's just worth knowing what a caseating versus a non caseating granuloma is and more often than not the answer is sarcoid because they like to test your TB knowledge in other ways. They'll give you like a vignette for TB. Um, fine. Uh, Izzy's made this lovely slide on take home messages. Um, yeah, so I think basically like for, I mean, it was different for our year last year because of COVID, but like the average mark for rheumatology was something like 97%. 
And it's not to say that then you should be like laid back and chill, but I'm just saying that like the questions were decent. Like it was a very, very good history, very barn door history. Um, and the antibodies, like if you're gonna learn anything, learning the antibodies, you could have got every single one right if you knew them. Um, for the OSCE, like my main advice would be knowing like the common questions to ask. Um, but like overall, like in exams, it's very simple. In real life, it's not so simple, I guess, with room. <laughs> yeah. It's like the most complex specialty. But, so, in ex- but, but I think from what they expect you to know, it's quite simple. I think, um, I think like I would actually go as far as saying as from an SBA perspective, this is the easiest specialty because you learn the antibodies and you'll get nine, like most of the questions, right? If not all of them. Um, um, I just know the extra articular manifestations as well, I think is always helpful because um, it's always a differential in like other things. So yeah, for breathlessness, sarcoidosis is one. It has come through in uh, A&E a couple of months ago was a first presentation of it. So it's not something that, you know, you only see in a blue moon it does happen but like overall your knowledge is like so so good like honestly really good and we were you know we were going for quite difficult stuff today um so you've all yeah you've all done really well thanks guys